Greetings, everyone, and welcome to City Lights Live. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. And tonight, City Lights, in conjunction with Beacon Press and Refugee Immigrant Transition, celebrate the publication of Humanizing Immigration, How to Transform Our Racist and Unjust System by Bill Ong Hing, published by Beacon Press. We are delighted and honored to have Bill Ong Hing with us tonight. He'll be in conversation with Jane Pack. Before we begin, as is customary, I would like to remind everyone that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatish Ohlone people. We would like to take this moment to offer respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. The book Humanizing Immigration arrives at a crucial crossroads in our historic moment as advancing technologies make it possible for wider scale inequities and human rights breaches to occur. We all need to think hard about the values you want to espouse and the ways in which we will need to defend them. It's a book like Humanizing Immigration is a call to action. And if we're to protect democratic principles, the struggle for racial justice, and espouse humanitarian values, we need to address immigrant and refugee rights. Humanizing Immigration not only stands as witness to the severity of our current situation, but offers us a roadmap towards how major reforms can be made to the immigration system. Bill Ong Hing urges us to adopt racial justice lens through which we can understand the root causes of migration and our country's culpability in contributing to those causes. Bill Ong Hing is professor of law and migration studies at the University of San Francisco and professor of law and Asian American studies emeritus at UC Davis. Previously on the law faculties at Stanford University and Golden Gate University, he founded the Immigrant Legal Resource Center in San Francisco and directs their Immigration and Deportation Defense Clinic. Professor Hing teaches immigration law and policy, migration studies, rebellious lawyering, and evidence, is the author of six books and was co-consul in the, to the U.S. Supreme Court asylum proceeding precedent case INS versus Cardoza Fonseca in 1987. So joining him this evening in conversation is Jane Pack. Jane is no stranger to City Lights. We've had the great pleasure of working with her in the past on our Humanizing Education Symposium. Jane is the co-executive director at Refugee Immigrant Transitions and adjunct professor in the Master in Migration Studies program at the University of San Francisco. Her scholarship and praxis are informed by critical refugee studies, liberatory education, and transnational solidarity. Uh, she has worked in the community, nonprofit, government, and business sectors. Please join us now in offering a warm welcome to our guests. It is such an honor to have you both with us. Bill Ong Hing, Jane Pack, welcome to City Lights. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. It's such an honor to be here and to be in conversation with Bill. Peter, I just have to start off by saying what an amazing human being you are. You walk the walk and um, you always bring in such great conversations into, into our midst. So thank you so much for, for bringing Bill into this space and bringing me back as well. Um, I, I want to start off, if I may, um, to, just to say like what an honor it is to be in this space. When Peter asked me to be in conversation with you, Bill, I, I didn't hesitate for a moment. And I just said yes, because as you know, I teach the class the night after you teach your class and students come into the class with conversations sometimes about your readings. And I've always wanted to sit in on your class, but haven't had the chance to do that. So reading your book was an extreme honor. And um, just really wanted to uplift your work and just your humility and, and the way you show up in the world. So thank you so much for being in conversation tonight. Well, um, thank you, Jane. And, and I, I, I want to point out to the audience that, that Jane is a committed leader in the migrant rights community as well. And she runs uh, a refu the Refugees in Transition program and talk about walking the walk and, and talking the talk. She, she's there and she's there day in, day out on behalf of refugees and, um, and and I admire your work so much. Oh, that's very kind of you, Bill. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I want to um, lift you up a little bit more, if I may. <laughs> you, you had a book launch on Saturday and you brought in many people who were represented in the book in terms of their knowledge and experiences. And you named all of them, um, minus one, but as, as a rising, but the rest of them as superstars. Um, the theme here is that you are threaded between and amongst all of them, as well as the work that they have done over the last 50 years. And that is so evident in your book. And it's just been so awe-inspiring to get to know you, but also read it and concretely in your book. So 
I wonder if I can start off. I wanted to read um, your dedication, and then I had a question coming from that, if I may. So Bill starts his book, and he says, I have to not cry. For the children I met at the Border Patrol Detention Facility in Clint, Texas, in June 2019, shame on our country for your confinement under unconscionable conditions. I pray every day that you have recovered and that you are enjoying the loving, safe life that you deserve. Th that's a really deep and emotional statement. And I think to me, as I read your book, there's obviously threads about children, the detention of children, the separation of children from parents all throughout the book. And I wondered if you could just talk to the various ways in immigration law, courts and policies um, where children are harmed. And I would say in some cases intentionally harmed and why we need to do better as a society. Well, Jane, thank you for reading the dedication. And uh, I, I continue to think about the dozens of children that I interviewed in detention in 2019 uh, who had been separated from the adults who brought them to the border. Uh, and this continues to happen to this day. Uh, in 2019, I was invited to be on uh, an inspection team ordered by a federal court to a border patrol station in Clint, Texas. And uh, we heard allegations that the border patrol was holding children for more than 72 hours before sending them on to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is a little bit better in terms of a custodial setting. And, uh, and when we arrived, we discovered 350 children who had been separated from their loved ones and they had been held for two to three weeks. And the youngest, people don't believe this, but it's documented, the youngest child that was separated from her aunt that brought her and left on her own was two years old, two years old. I interviewed two siblings who were the ages of four and 11 and the four-year-old had been so traumatized that he, could, he couldn't speak. And we brought in a, a pediatrician to, to deal with the four-year-old before the four-year-old opened up to me. Um, the, the reason I knew that there was a two-year-old that was separated because I, want, I went into a room to print up a document and the two-year-old, there was a two-year-old sitting on the lap of a 17-year-old who I thought was a mother. Across the room was a five-year-old who was being interviewed and the five-year-old was crying. And the interviewer of the five-year-old walked the five-year-old across the room to the two-year-old, the, the woman who was holding the two-year-old and that woman, the 17-year-old, calmed the five-year-old down. I printed my document. I left the room at lunchtime when we met as a group. I asked the interviewers what, what was going on. And they told me that that 17-year-old was the mother of neither two-year-old nor five-year-old. That 17-year-old happened to be detained in the same room as the two-year-old and the five-year-old who had been separated from the adults who brought them at the border and the 17 year old was only taking care of them out of the kindness of her heart. That should not be. Our country should not be detaining and traumatizing children in that manner. And it, it just goes on. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I think about those kids often and um, it, it's, it's not, um, it's not it's not hard to be motivated to fight on their behalf when you've witnessed that type of circumstance. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bill. And I know I know you carry these people with you um, just in the way you speak and 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 reference your work. And it's one of the things that I so admire about you is you know your humility and your your ability to hold so many people as you do your work. You know, this just reminded me of another passage in your book where you talk about um, some some lessons that immigration law can learn from different kinds of law, like criminal law, for example, where people have a right to a public defender, um, where that's not the case necessarily so, except for one exception, I believe, in immigration law. And you cite a judge who says something like, um, I've taught three-year-olds and four-year-olds how to about asylum or law or something like that. Could you could you speak to that a little bit more? So there is not a right to counsel in immigration proceedings, even though the result of a deportation hearing 
is banishment. It's deportation. You do not have a right to counsel. The only exception is for people who are detained, who have mental disabilities. That's the only exception. So the ACLU brought a lawsuit on behalf of children who were, who were expected to represent themselves in, in deportation hearings and to apply for asylum on their own. And they deposed a senior immigration judge who trains immigration attorneys. And in his deposition, he said, oh, it's no problem. I can teach a three-year-old how, how asylum works. I can teach a, a, a three-year-old asylum law, no problem at all. And the disappointing thing about the outcome of that case was, and it went up to the, to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals criticized the government for not providing right to counsel, but the Court of Appeals agreed that the Constitution does not require the right to counsel in civil proceedings like immigration hearings. That was the distinction that was made, that deportation hearings are considered civil in nature rather than criminal in nature. And uh, of course, when you have an attorney, uh, the, the data shows that when you have an attorney, you have a 70% chance of prevailing. When you do not have an attorney, you have about a 12% chance of prevailing. And so uh, it, it's... That's another example of where we've got to we've got to dismantle this this system when in the immigration court system at putting something in place that is humanitarian in nature and recognizes the lives that are at stake. Yeah, thank you. I you know just the focus on children really speaks to me, and I I I, I could tell in my own body that just the upset I was feeling when I was reading about all the forced and systematic family separations that were happening at the border and have been for quite some time. Um, it was interesting at the panel on Saturday, it opened with, I think you give her the pseudonym, pseudonym Lorena in your book, um, about her experience being separated from her father after he's deported. And then interestingly enough, the panel ended with a colleague of yours speaking to this luxury of growing up being with her parents and the luxury of having her children grow up with her. Of course, it shouldn't be a luxury, right? Can you, can you speak a little bit to um, this, this case that you, you wrote so beautifully about with L Lorena? Yeah, uh, Lorena uh, was a student, uh, a young student, a college student who heard me speak at an event. And um, a couple years later, uh, it turns out that her father was in deportation proceedings. He was a man who had lived here for 25 years. He was 50 years old, undocumented from Mexico, never had any run in with the law. He was a soccer coach. He drove the kids to after school programs. Uh, he was a, a regular church leader as well. Uh, but but ICE some one day showed up at the kitchen of the Hilton Hotel in Emeryville, California, and, and they went right after him. So somebody had turned him in and, uh, and he went through deportation proceedings. Now there is a relief in deportation that's called cancellation of removal for people who have resided here for more than 10 years and are of good moral character, but they have this extraordinary burden to show extreme and unusual hardship to their children if they're going to be deported. And, the, 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 and so they had an immigration judge who actually granted relief, granted cancellation, but the government appealed that grant by an immigration judge to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And the Board of Immigration Appeals ruled, why should we grant relief to this man? His children are healthy. The 12-year-old and the 22-year-old who at that time she was in, in at Berkeley, uh, they're healthy. And the only distress they're gonna have is an emotional. And so the Board of Immigration Appeals ruled that that was enough, not enough hardship and ordered the man deported. So at that point, the Court of Appeals wouldn't listen to it because the Court of Appeals doesn't review discretionary denials. So Zuma came to me to ask if I could get some other kind of relief. There was available at that time something called prosecutorial discretion 
and um, uh, under something called a Morton memo. And I was very confident that I could get the government to grant discretionary relief, irrespective of the ruling. Why was I so confident? Because it was the Obama administration. And I had seven or eight close friends who worked for Obama, who worked for the Department of Justice, who worked for the Department of Homeland Security. I contacted each and every one of them. I had a, another friend, Lorena had another mentor who knew Janet Napolitano firsthand. She was the, the head of the Department of Homeland Security. All of them told us this should be a grant of prosecutorial discretion. Here's the problem. The problem is that that decision is a local decision. That decision is for prosecutorial discretion is in the hands of the local director of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And he wrote me a letter denying the prosecutorial discretion relief on the same same grounds. If I'm going to grant, if I'm going to grant prosecutorial discretion for this man who has two U.S. citizen children, even though he has a an unblemished record, I would have to grant the same relief to so many others who have children here. So the night before he had to he had to report for deportation, I went to visit their family. Um, and I, 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 I tried to, um, I tried to bring my stiff upper upper lip. Um, it, it was, I felt it was my responsibility to show up and be there with them. Um, I, I, I believe in being present very much the way my colleague here at the law school, Jacqueline Brown, that many folks know as well, believes that we need to be present for our clients. Uh, that's our responsibility. And, and I said goodbye to him. Uh, and that was, 12 years ago when, when he was deported. Um, it just, uh, it, it, it's very upsetting uh, because of the havoc that it has wreaked uh, on that family. Yeah, thank you. And, and as, as, as this young woman spoke um, on Saturday, um, you talked about sort of the trauma, not only on herself, but also her younger brother, her sibling and her mother and so forth. And you detail that in your book. And what's just astounding to me as I was reading your book is how unaware people in the system are of trauma that people experience. And you talk about how the majority of asylum seekers have experienced trauma by definition if you're seeking asylum, you're 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 fearing persecution. So there's had there would have been some trauma in your life, or certainly fear of persecution. Can you speak more about that? Exactly. That's really an important point, Jane. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, I, uh, I, I I I I should give warning to those of you who are sensitive uh, that uh, I have to describe the hell that the vast majority of our clients have gone through. Um, we represent people from all over the world. Um, we represent many, many people from Central America. And, and Jane, I, I know that you're familiar with these clients as well uh, from your work. Uh, they've gone through the worst. Our clients have been raped. They've been kidnapped. They've been assaulted. Uh, uh, early, uh, to, uh, in in mid-October, I, I was doing detention work in Florence, Arizona. Uh, I have relatives on this on the Zoom call that probably didn't know that I was in Florence a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I represented people in detention there. I represented two men that had been raped, one by a police officer who gave him HIV and another by a, a drug dealer who was upset at the victim for not wanting to sell drugs for him. Our clients have gone through hell. They've been traumatized. They've suffered from post, they're suffering from post-traumatic stress. The reason why this is important for us to recognize is that it's hard enough. It's hard enough for many of us to remember things day to day, much less what happened under strenuous and traumatizing circumstances. But immigration judges, and asylum officers and, and government attorneys who cross-examine our witnesses, they expect perfection in the testimony. They expect there to be no nuance. They expect them to remember exactly what happened 
four years ago, they expect them to ex remember the exact details of how many people assaulted them, of what weapons were used against them, what time of day things happened. And when somebody falters just a little bit, it gives room for the immigration judge to rule that the person's not credible. And if the person's not credible, then their asylum application can be denied. And that is one of the big travesties of our asylum system is that, that it's treated, the whole system is so adversarial that there's no benefit of the doubt that is given to the asylum seeker. Um, and in, in the introduction that Peter had, he, he, he noted that I was involved in the Cordoso Fonseca case in the 1980s. And we won a case in, uh, in, in the 1980s, 86, called Cordoso, INS versus Cordoso Fonseca, um, in which the, the asylum law was interpreted to be the following. If there was a one in 10 chance that you might be persecuted, then you should be granted asylum. In other words, if there's a 10% chance that you're going to be persecuted, you should be granted asylum. When we won that case, we, we thought we had changed the world. We thought that we really had paved the way to a humanitarian relief. However, today, and this you can look this data up, uh, you can look up what the asylum approval rate is for every immigration judge in the country by name. If you know the name of an immigration judge, you can look up their, their asylum approval rate. Uh, my colleague who litigated Cordoso Fonseca with me, Dana Marks, uh, became an immigration judge. Her asylum approval rate after over a 35-year period was, about not, was in the 90s. She granted asylum in the 90s. We have encountered immigration judges in detention centers and elsewhere, whose asylum approval rates are 1%, 2%. There's a disconnect. And these immigration judges get away with it. They get away with it because of things like, oh, this person was incredible. They didn't remember that there were five people that assaulted them rather than six people. They thought, they said that they were assaulted in June on their application, but in the courtroom, they said July. You know, those are the kinds of distinctions that are made that often authorize immigration judges to deny. And the worst thing is that the vast majority of asylum applicants are not represented. And so we don't know what happens behind closed doors because most of those cases don't get appealed. And so that's why these immigration judges can get away with such low asylum approval rates. This, this thank you, Bill. This reminds me of um, another comparison or a learning you point out that we can we can have from criminal law, where you say in criminal law you're presumed innocent until you're proven guilty, and then I think in 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 asylum law you suggest you know just presume eligibility. Um, can you differentiate a little bit? So this was the 1980 Act um, when the right. asylum law came into effect. The difference between, um, um, where am I going here? I'm blanking. What, what, what the burden of proof? Oh, found, proof. yeah, well-founded fear versus um, um, the previous pr uh, provision of clear probability of persecution. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer, folks. So I'm like, I have to Google, like search for my notes here. You're, you're doing <laughs> fine. And at the risk of insulting my law students who are on this call, you're doing much better than most of my law students. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, uh, so burden of proof is a legal concept. And everybody who watches television and sees criminal law, they always hear the phrase, beyond a reasonable doubt, that guilt has to be proven by beyond a reasonable doubt, that's a very high burden. And the reason for that is it's criminal law and the consequence is somebody going to jail, right? Their liberty. Um, the, in, in, in most law, the burden of proof is not beyond a reasonable doubt. In, in most law, the burden of proof is preponderance. And that means 
51%, that you've got to show that it's more likely than not that something happened, more likely than not that the red car ran a red light, more likely than not that, that uh, somebody broke a contract, more likely than not. So that that's preponderance of the evidence. And prior to the 1980 Refugee Act, all that we had in the law, uh, and I started practicing in the mid 1970s. So prior to 1980, the, the only thing that you had available was something called withholding of removal. That, that, that was the only asylum-like provision. But that required, the Supreme Court held that that required preponderance of the evidence, showing that it's more likely than not that you would be persecuted. Uh, however, the 1980 Refugee Act introduced this phrase, well-founded fear of persecution. And so we successfully argued at the Supreme Court that well-founded fear of persecution was a humanitarian term. And even Justice Scalia uh, ruled in our favor. It was a six to three decision. Six judges, justices recognized that well-founded fear is a less burden than preponderance of the evidence. And they then, Justice Stevens came up with this 10% likelihood. So the importance of this, Jane, is what I propose is that given that humanitarian nature and that 10% language, we ought to think of asylum sort of in the flip side of, of criminal law, where you presume innocence in criminal law because of what's at stake. You presume innocence unless beyond a reasonable doubt, the person is guilty. I think we should do the same in asylum, that we should presume eligibility because of what's at stake. It's also life or death. That's what's at stake in asylum law. So we should presume eligibility unless the government can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is not going to be persecuted. That is my suggestion for the correct approach to asylum law. How humanizing. Well, it... <laughs> Right. It, it 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 recognizes that this is a humanitarian statute. The purpose of the statute was compassion. And you work with refugees, Jane. The purpose of the statute and the refugee law is to recognize what people have gone through and mm -hmm. that it's our responsibilities. It's our responsibilities as human beings to show the kind of compassion that was intended in the refugee law. Absolutely, I mean, I'm gonna bring, bring in critical refugee studies because as you know, it's something that I think a lot about and frames a lot of my my, my work and thinking. Um, the whole asylum system, just even based on the definition of refugee is based on fear. And, you know, I wanna call in the works of Critical Refugee Studies Collective um, and this book called Departures, another book, maybe Peter, for discussion at one point, where they're, these are refugee scholars themselves, and they have a whole chapter dedicated to a refugee critique of fear on livability and durability, right? The idea that we can center one's livingness and durability and hopefully futurity um, beyond just fear is a concept that I feel like very few people in the immigration system might, might think about. Um, you brought up a traffic, a traffic stop. I want to bring in Dana Marks, who you also mentioned earlier. <laughs> she yeah. had this quote in your book. Um, she says, uh, doing death penalty cases in a traffic court setting. That's what immigration courts are like. Can you can you share more about that? Her, her comment is so on target. So an, an immigration court room um, is... Uh, it has the semblance of a courtroom. There is a, 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 a podium where the judge sits and there's two tables for the uh, uh, for the counsel, but there's no jury box because there's no jury. It's the, the judge is the sole decision maker. They the judges are they call they are called immigration judges now, but guess who their employee is, their employer is? The employer is the attorney general of the United States. 
Okay, so they're not an independent judiciary. They essentially are administrative law judges. They work for an agency. They work for the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is an agency of the Department of Justice. And so they are subject to uh, they're subject to overview by a senior immigration judge that's stationed in in um, in Washington, and and also their their court their decisions are reviewable by another administrative body, the, the Board of Immigration Appeals. But if the if the uh, Attorney General doesn't like a decision of the Board of Immigration Appeals or the executive or the immigration judge, well, guess what? The attorney general can, on his or her own, issue a new decision overruling the Board of Immigration Appeals. What other agency has that kind of power that the head of the agency can overturn judges' decisions? So they're not real judges. Many of them are good friends of mine, but they're not real judges. And, and I'm not breaking anything new to them, okay? They don't have any resources. They don't even have subpoena power. They don't have any resources to order psychological evaluations. They don't have the discretion to call a timeout if, if necessary for a full investigation. And so, uh, so yeah, the, these are life and death cases. I would say that traffic courts actually have more power than immigration judges because a traffic court commissioner or judge can can split the difference and say, okay, well, the fine is $100, but I'll just fine you $50. Or or a, a traffic court commissioner can say, well, you know, I can see how this might be a hardship on you. So I'll just dismiss the traffic ticket for now because I feel sorry for you. Well, immigration judges can't do that. If they feel sorry for someone, if it's not in the law, they cannot exercise any discretion on behalf of, of that person. I mean, let me give you an example that I write about in the book. I, I had a, a client very, very early when I was a, a very young, uh, in my 20s, immigration lawyer. There was a woman who was a victim of an earthquake in Nicaragua in the 1970s. And she came to me. She got a visitor's visa because out of the kindness of his or her heart, and a, 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 an embassy official in in Nicaragua gave her a visitor's visa with her daughter because all their home was destroyed and they had relatives that were killed in an earthquake in the, in the early 1970s. And they, they came here, but they overstayed their visa and they walked into the immigration service asking what they could do. And the response was, what you could do is leave. And they, they wrote her up for deportation. And she came to me to see if I could do anything. And there was nothing. There was nothing in the law that provided any remedy remedy for them. So I came up with this argument that an immigration judge should have the inherent authority to dismiss a case if it's improvidently begun, if it should not have started in the first place. And so the judge was sympathetic, but he said, I don't have this power. The Board of Immigration Appeals was sympathetic and said, I don't have this power. And the, the Ninth Circuit, I took this case to the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit said that uh, nice try, but immigration judges can only do what is statutorily authorized, and they cannot show compassion. That they cannot exercise discretion if something should not have begun in the first place. They don't have that power, and so um, so that's another woman that I had to say goodbye to, uh, and she and her young daughter after living here for five years, were deported back to Nicaragua. And I, I actually kept in touch with them for several years. And and fortunately, she had a relative that took her in and her daughter ended up going to college. And um, to this very day, I'll bring it in and show it to you sometime, Jane. They, they sent me, of all things, I've gotten a lot of different gifts from clients. Usually it's food. Uh, but they sent that's, me a that's chair. a good thing. <laughs> they sent me a chair. They sent me a, a stool from Nicaragua that was made out of leather, and they they had it engraved to uh, Attorney Hing, Managua, Nicaragua on it. And I 
I use that chair in, in, in my closet when I sit down to change my shoes. So I'll bring it into wow. show sometime. That, that, that is really gorgeous. I mean, I think the impact you have on lives, um, I mean, Jacqueline spoke to it too on Saturday's panel, just, and how, how, how you become so close to them experiencing what they do in, in, in a different way, of course, not exactly, but that's just so powerful. I want to go along with that a little bit longer, if I can, like it, follow that chain back up to the attorney general, because you talk about Jeff Sessions and some of the harm he did right after he was appointed, like the kind of influence that takes place in there and how you and Judge Marks were advocating for more of like a tax court system that's more independent. If right. I got that right. Right, exactly. So um, after Donald Trump became president, he appointed uh, uh, first Jeff Sessions as attorney general and then later on uh, Bill Barr. And uh, they didn't like certain decisions. For example, they didn't like the fact that that uh, women who were victims of domestic violence in uh, machismo cultures uh, like Guatemala and Honduras might be able to get asylum if the police wouldn't protect them uh, from the domestic violence. They didn't like the fact that gang members might be granted asylum uh, even though the gang members had had killed your next door neighbor's son and was coming after your sons next because you wouldn't pay a bribe or you wouldn't allow your daughter to become a gang girlfriend a and, and the police wouldn't protect. They didn't think that that should be, they felt that was just common crime, that that's not persecution. So they issued uh, they issued their own decisions saying that you shouldn't be eligible for asylum under similar kinds of circumstances like that. Um, fortunately, that all changed back when Biden became the president and his attorney general, uh, Merrick Garland, reversed those decisions. But that's insane that such important principles go hand in hand with who the president is. There should be stable, there should be stable precedent on these issues. That's what we should rely on is stability when it comes to the, the judicial system. But because immigration judges are not independent, uh, Judge Marks, uh, Dana Marks has proposed for for decades that that there should be an independent judiciary. The immigration judges should be elevated to be what is called technically Article One judicial federal courts. And um, those of you who know the Constitution know that there are three articles, and and that generally Article Three is a judicial system. But Article, but Congress can also establish federal courts, and they've done that for bankruptcy and for tax. And so there are federal tax courts and federal bankruptcy courts, and those judges are appointed for 15-year terms, but they're independent. Uh, they can only be reviewed by the Court of Appeals and by the Supreme Court. They can't be reviewed by the Attorney General. Uh, and, and so that's what Judge Marks is proposing. That's what um, several members of Congress, Zoe Lofgren from Santa Clara County, mm -hmm. she's proposed that. Uh, to make the, the immigration court system finally independent of the political machinations of whoever the president is. Is there, is there any chance of that happening? Um, there actually is bipartisan support for that because <laughs> Republicans recognize that, hey, Joe Biden could change these things as well. Um, but, uh, we're at loggerheads in Congress when it comes to any type of substantive legislation. And I'm not just immigration. All the viewers on this uh, on the Zoom conference know this, that, that Congress is not working together. Congress is not negotiating. Congress is not going forward with legislation that should uh, that should be passed. And so I would say there's a chance, but I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, yeah. I just think about the effects of that. You know, this phrase I sometimes use is this permanent state of temporariness or like purgatory, right? Yeah. So this deferred action or whether it's temporary protective status or humanitarian parole is just the unknowing of if or when 
you may or may not be deported and what how that may or may not affect your family and it's just it just it just seems so cruel um, well that and, and jane you you got me involved in this uh two years ago when yeah, you right. advocated Thank on you. behalf of of uh of, of for humanitarian parole for for people from afghanistan and and you were helping so many people apply for humanitarian parole and and you had my students help you do that and we were happy to do that but it, that's another example of the politicization and i want to say race also that's the that factors into these kinds of decisions because when a similar situation happened for ukraine uh now it's almost you know more than a year and a half ago when ukrainians wanted humanitarian parole they were more gladly accepted to the united states than those refugees who wanted to come in from afghanistan and you can even compare for example haitians versus cubans that um for for years and years we welcome cubans because they're fleeing communism but Haitians for decades have been mistreated, even though they've been politically persecuted by, by the leaders of Haiti as well. But Haitians are labeled economic refugees. And, and these are people that are fleeing from the, 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 the poorest country in the hemisphere with the, with the highest infant mortality rate. Um, and you know, the whole Haitian situation is so awful. Again, two years ago, we saw examples of Haitians being whipped at the at the border in Texas. Um, and uh, it's it just, uh, those images are also hard to escape. And th that's the kind of, those are the kind of images that give me the, I don't know if energy is a word, but it, 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 it it, it it pushes me to do combat with with our government because our government is doing the wrong thing when it comes <laughs> to the treatment of migrants and um and we just can't stand for that we have to speak yeah. up we have yeah. to use whatever tools we have and I think your book does it so powerfully, <laughs> you know, I think that example, I remember being on these legal call, calls um, with with other, well, I'm not a lawyer, but with lawyers who were trying to figure out how to address this humanitarian fiasco, right, because the government collected, what, $20 million in fees, because they were charging each Afghan applicant $575 per person, so if you had a family of 10, then it was times 10, um, and eight months into you know, an application without a response, they were also working with Ukrainians who were coming in through the U for U program, um, application to arrival eight days, right? And and that's that's great. And we want that for everyone because, you know, at RIT, we work with communities from 50 countries around the world and see those discrepancies. So that really leads to that next question. It's you just name it. And, and I so, so appreciate um, your boldness and, and courageousness and, and just yeah, fearlessness of just naming it. And you call it blatant racism. We're not talking about like implicit racism or just blatant racism. Um, talk talk a bit, if you may, if you can, just not only about racism in the system, immigration system, but you also talk about the intersecting areas of racism within other systems as well. When you bring in, for example, well, I think you you called it crim M, like right. um, and these other uh, other systems. If you can unpack that for us, and and then I think somebody um, at the panel also talked about this really efficient detention to prison, detention right. to prison to deportation pipeline. Right. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that too, exactly. And and this praise proportionately actually more heavily on black migrants. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're reminded over and over again, year after year uh, of, of, of the racism that African-Americans uh, suffer in the United States. It's not just George Floyd, it's it's all the others. Uh, uh, and and uh, But what we couldn't, can't forget is that black migrants have this double-barreled problem. It's not just the criminal justice system, but if they're not citizens, they can end up being deported as well. And so it turns out that proportionately, there are more 
black migrants that are deported than any other groups. And, uh, and it's because of the criminal justice system first being racist towards, for, towards blacks and then Latinos, uh, Latinx. And then after that, uh, the, the uh, ICE is consulted by the local prison officials. They're called in. And we live in a bubble, Jane, in California because California is a sanctuary state. But in pretty much every other state in the country, the, the 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 ice phone is ringing off the hook and those phone calls are coming from local enforcement officials police officers and so th that's what they're facing um and you know what what uh, i i, I want to get back to part of uh the first part of your question a lot of people say well why don't people just get a visa why don't they just apply and come here and the problem is that the immigration visa system is is not available to vote most people. And there are backlogs in country after country after country of the from the places where people are, are migrating from. And so it's just not that simple. It's not like you can just go to the post office and apply for a visa. That's not the way it works. There's a wait list for, for countries where there's the highest visa demand from, from Asia, from Mexico, from El Salvador, from the Philippines. Um, and and the black migrant countries are their problem is that the vast majority of visas are available for family members, but black migrants don't have that same kind of history that that Asians might have or that Latinx community might have, and and therefore they don't have the ability to use the visa system the way the rest of us were able to do. But even even though the Chinese were able to make up for the long era of Chinese exclusion right after 1965, now there's backlogs for, mm -hmm. for Chinese immigrants who want to come to the United States. So it's just not that easy to, if you will, get in line for a visa because visas are not available. And not much focus is paid on that in the immigration debate. Namely, mm -hmm. we don't focus enough on expanding the visa system. Yes, we're and people like me and others were talking about deportation rights and right to counsel and that kind of stuff. But actually, one way to resolve a lot of the problems is providing more visas. Yeah, that that expression "get in line." I've heard some people say there is no line, right? It just sort of summarizes a little bit of what you said. Um, I've got one other question that really kind of gets to some of the troubles in the system. And then I wanna turn it around and look at some of the solutions and ideas because you propose some really great things. And then if there's time, if folks wanna add any questions into the chat, we'll try to address those as well. So I guess the last thing I was, you know, after I read your book, which again was amazing and I really encourage everybody on this call to buy 10 copies and share them with everybody you know, especially as the holidays are coming up um, <laughs> and elections around the corner. You know, you, you, you title it um, Humanizing Immigration, How to Transform Our Racist and Unjust System. You know, I, I, it got me thinking about like John Galtung, who, who's a peace scholar, right? And he talks about um, peace in two ways, negative peace being sort of the absence of violence, like physical violence and positive peace, which goes further and includes the absence of structural or indirect violence, right? Um, and, and the results and talks about the results of social structures or institutions that prevent people from meeting their basic needs and accessing their human rights. And it really made me think about how proactively violent the system is from that particular framework. And it just hit me so strongly and it got me down this path of thinking about other violent systems, other, state systems, uh, perhaps in like authoritarian states where we kind of condemn various acts. And so I'm just gonna read a, a few things that um, I, I pulled out for folks who haven't had the chance to read your book yet is, is um, questions about proportionality, right? Um, the inconsistency in the system. So that's not as active, that's sort of more sort of a consequence I think of, of just unclear sort of regulations perhaps. The systems of de deportation and family separation, um, the detention deportation pipeline that we just mentioned, um, not in your book, but mentioned on Saturday was of course, Operation Lone Star. These are the buoys and the razors that Governor Abbott has put and It's just horrific. I mean, with the intent of quote unquote deterrence, but really is aiming to physically harm 
um, people who are seeking refuge. Um, and then again, the blatant racism that you talked about and 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 the, some of the policies that Jeff Sessions and other have put in place, like the Remain in Mexico, Title 42, uh, family separation, so on and so forth. So with all that in mind, <laughs> mm-hmm. you talk about some reform possibilities. Um, you talk about s- examples of where we can move away from this sort of really black and mo- black and white model, all or nothing model of like deport or stay, where you can have like diversion programs, where you can have like integration with family law, I believe it was. Um, and then later in the book, you talk a little bit about the the trap, right? The trap of um, reform conversations or reform advocacy, and then call for abolition. Can you spend some time talking about that? Yeah, thank you, Jane. Um, but, 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 First of all, it, it's um, I've been in this business for almost fifty years, and and I, I'm guilty of this as much as anyone else. You know, something occurs, and I make a suggestion for change, and and so when I stepped back and looked at the overall purpose of this project, I realized that we're just working around the edges, and that yeah, we we could make a little tweak here and there to make things better for individuals who might be affected by the visa part or or somebody who might deserve a second chance uh somebody who um who made a 15 minute a 15 second mistake and did something stupid and then they're convicted of an aggravated felony and there's they've lived here all their lives but because they never became a citizen they're going to be deported and separated from their spouse and their children and and so my proposal is to step back and to rethink the entire system, to be honest with you. And so I really think that we ought to begin from a position of humanity, believing that our first place to start is that we are a nation of immigrants. And you know, we can we could spend another two hours talking about how we ended up being a nation of immigrants and how we, as Peter pointed out and you point out, how we took over this land. But putting that aside for a moment, and, and, and I know that's hard to put aside for many people, we should begin by understanding why and asking, why are people moving here? Why do they want to come? And if we listen to why people are coming, what we will hear, if we pay a lot of attention, we're going to hear the voices of our own parents or grandparents and why they came. The striking similarity between not just poverty and hunger or or the desire to do better for your family, but many fled persecution, many fled violence, many fled oppression or the threat of oppression. And I think that we would begin to realize that if we put ourselves in the shoes of others, that we would develop a position of visas, on deportation, on asylum, on who we should welcome. We we will look at it so much more in a humane way that that in my opinion would 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 serve our hearts better. That mm. honestly sometimes I can't I don't understand how some of the, the evildoers that I encounter and that I write about in the book, how do they go to sleep at night? I, mm-hmm. I just, I don't understand how they can do that, how they can be so mean and cruel yeah. to people. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm urging people to, hey, do something right so you can finally get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Well, you open the book with with a with a, a story of somebody and and it, with an encounter with an immigration officer, and <laughs> I think you say, and that wasn't the first jerk I met who was an immigration officer. <laughs> I was just like, you you make this book so accessible, the complex labyrinth. I think you said ju- some judges call immigration law just so accessible. Um, can you can you read that last page from your epilogue? Sure. That last paragraph. Okay. Just to continue um, what you were saying. Yeah, but but I urge all who will listen to me to ignore the conventional wisdom. For for change to happen, we must believe that change is possible. And that's where our advocacy should be focused, 
The barriers to the goal of abolition are daunting, but one thing I know for sure is that without radical change, racist immigration pol policies will be perpetuated. Without abolition, people who would not be deported will be removed. Families will be separated and children will be detained in cages. Bend the ears and rattle the cages of policymakers at every opportunity. Be an ally, stand with immigrant communities at the workplace, in their neighborhoods and in the streets. Be creative and look for allies in the name of disruption. Be on the right side of history on, the, on, the, on these matters of fundamental human rights. Believe that abolition, abolition and transformation are possible. Thanks, Jane. Thank you so much. Um, I know you have a class that you need to teach. Um, I'm just in awe of your work that you were there for the 1980 you know, Refugee Act to this day. And I know you've got family on this call and I just want them to know, I'm sure they do already, but from another perspective, how respect, respected you are in, in so many communities. When your name comes up in spaces, people say, he is my hero. <laughs> and he is so kind. And I know he's one of the busiest people I know, one student said, but you know what he does is when you go into his office, he always sits with you and he gives you a book, <laughs> a book to read so that you can get more in depth into what he's like thinking because he doesn't have the time to explain this whole book to you. Um, you're a genius. You're wonderful. You're, you're a great role model for so many of us and again what's so amazing is you're just so humble um so it's just an honor to be in community with you bill and i see other colleagues jonathan and others on this call so um do you have any closing words that you want to share before you teach your class to cohort eight <laughs> no i i'm i'm i i feel blessed i i think i'm the luckiest person in the world um I, I think of my the the wonderful life that my two granddaughters are able to have. And that's what inspires me to want the same kind of lives for other children and their parents. And so um, that's what makes life meaningful to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peter, well, you want to close us out? Yeah, thank you both for, for gracing our halls. I mean, it's an honor having you both with us here tonight. I mean, you're the equivalent of superheroes to us here at City Light. So, Professor Hank, congratulations on this important new book. Jane, always great having you do the, the honors and to be back in your orbit again. And thanks to all of you in the audience who joined us tonight. It was a great crowd. Uh, you always complete the circle. And so we're very grateful for that. Tonight's program has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So, so long, everyone. Take care. We hope to see you all again soon. <laughs>